So we got a lot to talk about today. Uh, we're going to dive into some draft stuff, but I want to make sure that I allow uh, people to leave as early as possible. So I'm definitely going to start off with uh, the news of our new tight end coach, um, because that's the one topic that people just love to rage on with me about, but whatever. So, uh, but I'm not going to skip over it. Um, not going to spend too much time. You know, if you watch the Juan Castillo um, um, episode, then you know how I feel about it. I feel the exact same way about it. Um, and that's how it goes. I mean, you could choose to be optimistic and that's fine. I'm not telling you that you can't be. Uh, you can believe that this small tweaks can, you know, make big differences. That's cool. Uh, just in my personal opinion, that's not how football usually works with the coaching staff. So that's how I feel with it. But allow me to use this as another opportunity to once again, because this the, the, the debate is just, it makes no sense to me. Not one person has made any sense to me. Again, if you want to say there's a lack of talent at tight end, we could debate that uh, past uh, Trey Burden. Definitely. I mean, you could debate that with anybody. I'm not going to debate you a whole bunch on it um, because we don't have a lot of top tier tight ends. Um, however, when we talk about production, everybody, everybody, I swear, this is how I know it's a narrative started by somebody because everyone keeps repeating it. Everybody talk about the tight end production. And so when you're talking about production, you're talking about numbers. And production, as I've said many times, does not happen in a vacuum. And for the people that don't know what I mean by that is tight ends don't throw to themselves. <laughs> so you don't just have numbers because you have numbers. You could run a per Trey Burden, and he's shown this many times, can run a route and be wide open. Does not mean he's getting the ball. Does not mean the ball is going to be delivered in a catchable way or that the quarterback ever sees you. And even even if it's the a bad pass, it doesn't the quarterback might not even get the ball off because he got sacked. There's a number of things. Offense doesn't happen in a vacuum. It doesn't. Like you affect things in defense, but for the most part, you know, you can make plays individual of your other counterparts. It makes it easier for you. But you can make plays. Look, if a defensive end doesn't sack the quarterback, that doesn't mean the corner can't make an interception. His production can still happen. A tight end's production can't happen without the other pieces. And so it'd be one thing. So people say that the tight end's an issue of this, this. If you say there's a lack of talent, we could have a discussion. If you said our tight ends don't run correct routes, we could have a discussion, not a long one because you don't know what routes they're being told to ram, but we could have a discussion. If you told me they were dropping every pass that was thrown to them, and we know we all as a team drop passes, we could have a discussion. But when you just say there's a lack of production, as in lack of numbers, that doesn't mean anything. That That's like, it does not matter at all. You could have Travis Kelsey out there. If the quarterback doesn't throw him the ball, he doesn't throw him the ball. And so for me, my um, assumption, not assumption, my assertion this whole year, and has I've shown you on film, there's many times Trubisky is just throwing to Allen Robinson just because that's who he trusts. That's who he's forcing the ball to, or that's who his number one read is, and he's not looking at other places. And so a lot of times, whether it's a uh, burden when he was playing or not, or Shaheen or anybody else, they weren't getting targeted. And so if you sit here, which you can't, but if you sat here and said, Terry, look, here's the target share. Tight ends got 60% of the targets that were thrown and we didn't get any production. That's a discussion, but you can't say that because Allen Robinson by far led the target share. And so all this talk about the tight end, then of course people add context to it. Well, they weren't getting targeted because they can't get open. They can't run routes or they can't catch. That That's not true either. The, again, the tape, again, if we go to tape and you show me that tight ends just can't get open or have never been open and Trubisky never missed a read to them and, and you know, we're calling plays specifically for tight ends 
and they're just not making it happen, we could have a conversation. But that's never been the case. Not with Shaheen, not with Burden, not with anybody. And so I don't want to hear it. I really don't want to hear it. And then the second part of that is I believe it doesn't take much to be a great tight end. As far as like, oh, you got to be a first round pick or you got to run like this. No, it really doesn't. Like I said, tight ends make huge plays on play action and zone. And that comes from scheme. And that comes from a quarterback being able to uh, see through the zone. And so there's very few tight ends. And I mean probably one or two that are out here running like a receiver, breaking up people in man coverage and getting wide open. Most of them are pushing off play action or they're in zone. And that's it. And we can do that with anybody. It doesn't matter who it is. So the whole tight end thing, besides blocking now, that's different. We could have that conversation. But most of the top tier tight ends aren't blockers. So, again, not a big conversation. Me Anyway, we spent a lot of time on it. So that's how I feel about all that. Now, let's get into the draft. So, uh, I should have pulled this up first, but I was uh, talking last night, or not really talking, but I was in the community, and I put up a post, a poll for people to vote, because I was thinking, I'm, you know, I'm in draft mode, I've uh, almost finished the, the uh, tackles, which is my first group that I watch, and so I'm in draft mode, and so I put up this question basically asking what do you want us to do with uh what philosophy do you want us to go into this draft with and so uh basically it's a question of do you want us to stay with our two second round picks as they are currently or do you want us to use those picks to go you know trade both to get in the first round or would you like us to trade one of those picks plus like maybe a fifth round pick or maybe, you know, uh, whatever pick to move up in the second round. So we uh, still pick twice, but we get a higher second round pick. Or would you like us to use the second round pick and maybe a future second round pick or a future third round pick and try to get into the first round? Or, you know, would you like us to uh, trade one of those second round picks and get multiple picks in the draft, whether it's third round, fourth round, whatever? And so uh, I think that was all the combinations for the most part. But anyway, by far and large, we got about 74 votes right now, but 69 percent, not going to laugh, 69 percent of the votes right now say stay with the second round picks as they are. And um, not not uh, not too surprised. I thought that would be the leader. Um, I didn't think it would be that far of the leader, but I definitely knew that be what most people want to do uh just stay pat we played around in drafts before not everybody thinks it worked out and so they kind of want to stay with what we have um that's fine that's one philosophy the second largest is to trade one of the second round picks to acquire third round picks now that's where i fall if i'm looking at if i'm coming into it as my own uh gm or whatever that's probably more so what i would be looking at um our second round picks have a little bit of distance in between them it's not like we're picking you know back to back and so for me i would probably lean towards hey if that later second round pick is attractive to somebody who has multiple third round picks um then that's probably what i would look at if they have premium third round picks, then I would definitely think about trading our first second round pick. Uh, but even if I could get a third and a fourth, because right now we pick twice in the second round and then we don't pick again until the fifth round. And so if I could get some of those uh, uh, mid round picks restored back, I would definitely do that, especially if it means I get to also pick in the second round. Um that's something that I would definitely want. Now, a lot of people were kind of mentioning, you know, it it matters who, what, what player we're talking about and all that. And yeah, yeah, I understand that. But I'm just talking about in general, like the general idea of what you would like to see happen with those picks. It doesn't matter who the player is. Like we could do what you want and not get the player <laughs> that you want. 
we could get the player you want and maybe not have done it the way you thought we would. So I'm not really talking about the player. I'm just talking about what you would like to see happen in the draft. And for me, I, I definitely would like to see us recoup either two third rounds would be beautiful, might be a little uh, ambitious. But if I could get a third and a fourth round for one of my seconds, I would definitely do that. So that at least gives me more of a complete draft. And so that way I don't have to give up any fifth round picks or six, seven round picks. And I can use those late round picks to move around if I want. Because three fifth round picks is a lot. So um, I would definitely still want to have that type of capital. But that that's where I'm leaning at. Um, but I'm fine with staying with where our second round picks are too. It is tough um, when you're talking about a, a specific player. And so... There is certain times I might think about going back into the first round, but uh, what I would absolutely not want to do is use both second round picks to get into the first round. What I would much rather do is to use a future pick and a second round pick to get in the first round, because I do believe we're in a window now still, despite how things look, I think we're in a window and it's time to, you know, put some good tools in there now. If we're we're getting somebody that we feel can be plug and play and that could contribute, then I'm, I'm down with it, you know, to give up some capital. What I don't want to do is give up current capital instead of future capital because we want to see what the future is going to hold. I think right now our window is right now, so... That's how I feel about that. Uh, but definitely go to the comment section. Let me know. Go to the poll and vote if you didn't. I know it might be confusing listening to me say it, but um, yeah, go to the comment section, whatever. Let me know what you want to see us do with our picks as far as actual capital, not players. All right. So speaking of players, I also put a poll. I should have scrolled down to this. Um, not too long ago. Now, again, this is, again, just off the cuff. Uh, reaction. This isn't my uh, 100% proof opinion, but uh, it, I guess it's only been a week ago. It feels longer than that. I said, I think we should use one of the second round picks on Jalen Hurts. Now, I didn't say trade up for him and all that. I'm talking about in this scenario, we just stay where we are. Now, um, I put up a poll. Now, let's see. So uh, 41%, which was the favorite, said uh, I'll take Jalen Hurts if we don't have to move up in the second round, which is where I'm at. And then the second one was no, I don't want Jalen Hurts. We have other needs to fill. After that, well, it was a tie after that. 13% uh, said no, There's uh, I don't want Jalen Hurts. There's better quarterbacks. And 13% said, yes, I want Jalen Hurts, whatever it takes. So definitely some spread out, you know, around the votes there. And that's 151 votes. So, um, but the vast majority said, yeah, I would take Jalen Hurts if we don't have to move up. So here's where I'm coming from with that. And this is pre me doing my um, evaluation of him. Uh, I've seen Jalen Hurts when he was in Alabama, of course. Uh, I watched a quick game or two um just when i do the preview of the class and here's what i i feel like because a lot of people are like he's just trubisky the difference is he's a lot more athletic than trubisky trubisky's got good wheels but he's not jalen hurts and part of me at the moment when i was saying this is i'm thinking about lamar jackson and everything now i'm not jumping the trend um i could i could talk about him a little bit but I'm thinking about him. I'm thinking about uh, Nagy's creativity that we heard about. Haven't so much seen. Um, a lot of talk from the inside, a lot of rumors from the inside, is that Nagy feels handcuffed by Miss Trubisky. I don't know if that's true, but I can tell you uh, X's and O's wise is true because either you handcuffed by what Trubisky can do or you're asking him to do things he can't do. Either way, it's not a good look. So I'm thinking about what Nagy's specialty might be, what would help the offensive line, especially no matter who you got. An offensive line and spread gets helped a whole lot. That's why you got a lot of players get drafted high that aren't that great. But anyway, 
it helps a line. You don't need a line as much when you're doing some of these uh, types of things. And so I, the other thing was his arm strength. Now, a fast quarterback with a big arm, we've seen that before. It's not new. But again, I'm just thinking about what could incorporate into this offense that would give it a little bit of sting like a Ravens offense where people are like, hold on, you know, they're really stressing us right now and we'll figure it out. But right now they're stressing us. But what also would uh, help simplify what the offensive line has to do and take advantage of the athletes that we have. And I'm like, cause at the end of the day, I struggle so much with Tariq Cohen and I get it. I struggle because I know his vision and all that is just he's not helping us, but he's a freak. He can make plays and, you know, other people, too. So I think about that types of stuff. I think about Jalen Hurts um, coming from where he came from to get to Alabama starting spot um, and then relinqu- relinquishing it the way he did to Tua if you don't follow that stuff. Um, he was a great team player about it. And he didn't leave. He sta- he eventually left, but he didn't leave right away. And so, uh, and he continued to come in on different packages. And so I think about uh, his ability to adapt in different systems. I think about the arm. So uh, if he didn't have an arm, uh, all the running wouldn't matter because you can't threaten down the field. But he has that arm that can go down the field. Um, I don't know. I, I just look at him play. And knowing what his background is not like all these other spread quarterbacks that the coach tells you exactly where to go and you just clap your hands and throw it there. Like he's actually grown in football. And I think uh, a pro style mentor would only help him. And he's shown to be the type of kid that can grow. So some of that might change as I watch his film. But I think the intangibles are what they are. Uh, I think he's, uh, well, I know he was a well-liked kid in Alabama, um, good teammate, uh, tough guy, a lot of good running ability. Even if Trubisky was to stay the starter, think about what you would now have as a, um, as a red zone option. And it's funny, I said this to my friend uh, who started out in coaching with me. I told him about two years ago. I was like, dude, the next wave that you're going to see in football is going to be red zone quarterbacks. I'm telling you it's going to start. It's going to happen. It just makes too much sense because you're going to have too many spread quarterbacks who aren't real quarterbacks going to the league and you only can get value out of them when you're doing those types of things. And sure enough, uh, they did that with Jalen Hurts in Alabama. They did it with Mariota a little bit this year once Tannehill took over. And I just think, I mean, they did it with Lamar Jackson before he was the starter. I I really think that's what you'll have. And I think having Jalen Hurts immediately gives you a new red zone presence, even if he isn't starting. And then, of course, he's going to put the pressure on Trubisky, which I don't necessarily think Trubisky needs. I think Trubisky just needs to be traded um, and get a a breath of fresh air outside of Chicago. But if you were going to keep him, I think it would put somebody in the room to challenge him a little bit. So I'm with it. I mean, we got two second round picks. Honestly, there's a lot of premium talent in the first round that we're just not going to have access to. And we got needs in different places, which we're going to talk about. But yeah, that's that was my case for uh, Jalen Hurts. And I'll I'll uh, update you as we continue to go through it. But go to the comment section. Let me know what you think about getting Jalen Hurts. All right. So speaking of needs, everybody wants to talk about the needs of the Bears going forward. Um, now, it's it's always funny because people love talking needs. And then they always, after the draft, be like, you don't draft off needs. You draft best player available. That's two different philosophies. Uh, people can have their different philosophies. So it is what it is. I just thought that was funny. But um, so you can have your different philosophy on how you think we should approach the draft like that. Uh, given our capital, we have two second round picks, three fifth round picks, six and a seven. Now, I understand, and people have to understand this. Teams are unique. Every last team is unique. So saying that every pick matters is not true for every team. 
uh, not just their roster, but their philosophy. Some people don't value picks the same way. Some people don't use picks the same way. Some people don't give chances the same way. Like I always said, if Russ Wilson went anywhere besides the Panthers, I mean, not Panthers, if he went anywhere besides the Seahawks with Pete Carroll, he wouldn't be where he is because the money they gave Matt Flynn to give this dude a, a legit chance to go after the, the quarterback spot, you, you don't see it. And some people don't really value late round picks like that. And so um, not saying we're one way or the other, but the idea that every single pick is going to be on the team, and can, that's not true. Uh, we saw it from last year's draft. Not everybody's going to make it. And so for that reason, I don't get too caught up in the seventh and sixth round picks. Not to say there won't be guys that I like as I get through this uh, process. I'm sure there will be. Alex Bars was one of those guys that, as I got to the end of the process, I was really big on. Um, and then we actually end up getting him in the uh, – we end up getting him in the uh, – what is that called? <laughs> the undrafted free agency. There we go. All right. And it's funny how everybody wants Alex Bars, who was coached by Harry Houston. But anyway, so um, I look at it this way as far as our needs, like our, our top premium needs – um, I, I struggle with it because the fact of the matter is Massey and Leno are under contract. And I've said multiple times and I'll say again, in my mind, the best way to utilize it is getting a left tackle that allows Leno to be a right tackle, who is a heck of an athletic right tackle in the league. Um, and then that lets Massey be a right guard who I think, I think he'll be better with less space. Um, now, does that make us an, a, an amazing line? Absolutely not. But unlike everybody else, I don't think we're some dumpster fire, especially after you saw last year. And obviously we were good enough to be good, um, to be good enough. That's funny. Um, and so I think we could do things, especially with a legit left tackle. I definitely think we can do some things. And I think, uh, with that type of line, the scheme needs to uh, evolve more. As I said, we're just not people that are going to blow people off the ball. We need to uh, be a little better with our zone, be a little better teaching our running back how to uh, run through zone and those different things. This idea that we're just going to come in and rebuild the entire offensive line in the draft is a pipe dream, to be honest. Now, it's not impossible but it's a it's a pipe dream because um, what are we going to have? Two tackles from the second round and, <laughs> and three interior linemen from the fifth round or two interior linemen from the fifth round. It's just not it's, that's not how it's going to look. Of course, there's free agency in there as well. So that, that helps, too. Um, but that that's my biggest thing. So when I look at the second round and I look at this draft, as I mentioned before, there is a lot of tackle talent. And I'm almost done with tackles, but I'm still waiting for um, the USC and the Iowa tackle to declare. And so if they declare, you're talking about even more. I'm talking about I, I've seen four legit first round tackles already. And that's without the two that haven't declared. So besides the amount of talent that's going to be there, there's going to be other talent that gets pushed down. And so I think in the second round, possibly trading up the, you know, depending on the market, it's, it's imperative that we get somebody on the offensive line that can help. And there's a couple people that are candidates. There are some candidates, uh, and we'll talk more about it, but I, I think there are some people that will be worth it in the second round. And uh, so I'm looking at offensive line as one of the needs. Uh, one of the top needs. But for me, honestly, the top need is cornerback. I think cornerback is um, not as deep as they thought it would be this year because some people went back. Um, a lot of people feel like there's a big drop off after the top corner. But I think cornerback is one of the needs. And I'm talking about speed. Now, I think Tolliver deserves a shot. That's the other thing about it, too. So, I don't feel super strong about any of these needs. I do have a hierarchy of what I want first, but I don't feel super crazy strong about it. Um, 
because outside of the premium tackles, there's nobody where I'm like, we have to have that person. Uh, outside of the top corners, there's nobody like you have to have him. Plus, I think Tolliver is in the position going into his third year where he definitely has a shot to start. Now, you're talking about drafting somebody for depth and whatever. That's fine. We just drafted a bunch. of. We always draft a bunch of D-backs. So, you know, uh, Snelly is, or it's not Snelly. Shelly is um, a nickel, but, you know, you only got one nickel at a time. So. Maybe even him as depth and, you know, getting him some looks. I think we got bodies and we can find bodies at corner. But I do think that's one of the positions where we need to turn our attention to. Um, so I just kind of went in a circle a little bit. So I guess corner wouldn't be my next biggest one. I would probably say safety. And I don't know much about the safety class, but I do think we need more of a traditional system. And it's. I'm not going I'm not going to harp on it, but I just think it's interesting to see a lot of people saying that now and how Eddie Jackson needs to be over the middle and all that. And OK, so basically people want something more close to Amos. And I think they're probably going to bring Clint Dix back. And Lord knows we drafted enough safeties, but um, I still think that's probably where I want to go. Now, if there is a veteran out there. I probably feel a little more comfortable with that. And there's a lot of good safety play in the league right now, especially box safeties. So uh, I'm down for that as well. Uh, but defensive back, I'll say, is up there. So you're talking about tackle, defensive back. Interior, I can't say we do need a right guard viciously. I understand that. I don't know that I'm saying, like, because with our picks – I don't know that I'm saying there's a second round guard I need, and I don't know that I want to wait to the fifth round. And so there's an issue there. But we know on the offensive line, like I said, there's some candidates that play tackle that can play interior and be emergency tackle. There's some swing tackles. There's some five tool players. So there's ways around, but I don't know with our current picks if we would have access to them without reaching. But uh, it, it would be interesting. I think O-line in some shape or fashion. So now I'm not really talking about exactly what we should do with the picks. This is more what type of players we should go after. But I think uh, one thing we've always liked is people with position flexibility. And I agree. We need to continue that. And we need to just decide what route we're going to go as an O-line. Are we going to try to be power or are we going to try to be finesse? So there's that. Uh, and then pass rusher, I've talked about that to I've been blue in the face. <laughs> I talked about that before we got Khalil Mack, been talking about it afterwards. This isn't a great edge rusher class from what I hear. I, honestly, from the edge rushers I've seen at the top, I'm not impressed <laughs> at all. And so I can only imagine what's in the middle tier. So this might not be the draft for that, but uh, edge rusher is definitely something we would want to think about. And I think we need to get faster. Uh, I see some people say we got to get younger fast. I don't know exactly that we got to get younger, but we got to get faster in some positions on defense. Um, definitely in uh, cornerback. I mean, Fuller's a all pro type corner, so he is what he is. But the opposite corner, we got to get faster. And I think on the D-line, we got to get faster, just in general, like everybody. <laughs> and so bringing in some speed, because that's the one thing that really translates automatically. Like, you might not have hands, you might not have moves, you know, you might not understand leverage. But if you're fast off the ball and you know how to threaten it or you know how to um, use your motor, you can make plays. And that's one thing, like. Leonard Floyd was probably one of the fast off the ball, but he just didn't get after it. And maybe they didn't let him get after it, but he just didn't get after it. And so I think getting some more speed along the D-line, not just there, but along the front as well. Now, this is more philosophical, you know, eye front, even front stuff, but I just think we need to be faster. That's me personally. So, uh, yeah, I think that's where I'm looking at. And I, I, I don't always get huge into the needs. But it will become more and more of a conversation as I go through more of the players. And then we can really talk about who's out there to go get. But that's what I'm looking at. Uh, so I want to wrap it up, though. Maybe I should have said this uh, earlier. 
um, with a player that's on my radar, and that's Josh Jones. Now, I didn't want to put it in the title and all that. I want people to start talking and getting the buzz up. Um, but Josh Jones out of Houston, I like it. I like him a lot. And um, I probably won't go into depth on him on the tackle episode. So I will talk a little more about him here. And I would say that, look, um, he's he's got some polish that needs to happen. Um, he was a big time basketball, not big time, but, you know, a, a pretty well known basketball player in high school. Uh, he played football as well, but um, maybe he was more of a basketball player. I don't know. But I know he comes from a big program. And so there's still some polish there, but he's been starting for years. Um, and I think he's got it, man. I think he absolutely has it. The frame uh, is very nice. It, it's not uh, like over overly bulky or fat. It's, it's, very, it's more like a Tyron Smith, if you think about his frame coming out, where he's more long and lean and can put more muscle on the frame, but he's still a big dude already. Big hands, good feet. You could tell he did play basketball pretty well. Athletic. And and one of the things that I, I noticed from the bat is that when he gets in space, he hits people. He, I mean, he doesn't run past linebackers. He doesn't miss with an angle. He gets his hands on it. And he runs with them and he moves them. His screen game is amazing and good pass protection, but also not soft and run blocking. I think he could get technique cleaned up with the run blocking, but as far as his willingness, it's there. And he shows some nasty attitude. And so I'm excited. I'm excited because right now he has a little bit of buzz, but it's mostly mid second round. So I really think we got a shot at getting him and this fits the profile of what I'm saying with kick Leno over right guard, kick Massey inside, or Leno to right tackle, Massey inside to right guard, bring in some other people for competition, but that really fits the mold of what I'm talking about. And so uh, Josh Jones out of Houston, uh, left tackle, I would say uh, check him out. So anyway, that's it for me. Go down in the comment section. Let me know what you think about all that. Thumbs up, subscribe, share it around, get the conversation started. And remember, stay up and bear down.